What's going on guys? Today I'm going to explain some abnormal titans that have appeared outside of the main attack on titan manga. For those of you that haven't seen my other video about abnormals, that one focused on titans created by Isayama himself, with notable examples being the talking titan and of course the massive rod rice titan. This time around what we're going to do is examine the freaky abnormals created by other authors, in particular the ones that showed up in the No Regrets spin-off and the Before the Fall prequel series. Both of those stories have a bunch of unique titans that never appeared in the main show, and as we continue the video I'll also be giving my detailed thoughts on whether either of them is officially canon. Before we get into it, be sure to hit that sub button if you want to see more Attack on Titan content like this, and I'd appreciate if you dropped a like as well as it does help out the video. Okay, so starting off with no regrets, this was the origin story of why Levi joined the Survey Corps, and the amount of abnormal titans was different when you compare the manga version to the OVA. In the manga there was only one abnormal which was 20 meters tall, and I'm going to call this one the Twisting Titan, because whenever someone latched onto it, it would keep shaking its body around to throw them off balance. That type of intelligence combined with its height made it way more dangerous than a regular pure titan, but on their first expedition, Levi, Isabel and Furlan were able to take it down by launching a coordinated attack. For some reason though, the OVA completely changed this scene so that instead of the titan being a 20 meter abnormal, it was reduced to a 10 meter normal titan that didn't have any special qualities. That's why in this version, Levi easily killed it by himself without any help from his friends, which to me was a much less interesting way of doing the whole interaction. The anime also added this random abnormal that kept running and jumping with both his hands raised in the air, although this one was quickly dispatched by Flagon, who was the squad leader overseeing Levi and the gang. Sadly, by the end of the OVA, his entire squad was killed by yet another abnormal, and this one was special for a couple of reasons. Number one, it had red eyes, which, from what I can remember, is the first time this has happened that wasn't just for dramatic effect, and number two, it was one of the few titans that was built to move on all fours. Running on all fours means its movement can be massively unpredictable compared to what the scouts are trained to come up against, and on top of that, it attacked them during a rainstorm where they could barely see anything. As a result, it caught the whole squad by surprise and killed literally everyone who was there, with Levi only rejoining the group after the massacre was over. By the time he arrived, the abnormal was chewing Fallen in half, having already ripped off Isabel's head, and remember, these were the only two people Levi cared about in his life. The OVA did a better job of portraying the unhinged anger he'd feel after losing people to the titans for the first time, because the way he tore it apart was even more brutal than what he did to Zeke. With that said, the question now becomes is any of this stuff canon to the main timeline, and the answer to that depends on whether you're talking about the No Regrets manga or the OVA. Isayama confirmed in chapter 80 that Isabel and Furlan were real characters that existed in this universe, as their vestiges appeared in Shiganshina as Eren was talking to Levi. The problem is that this doesn't confirm which version of their story is the canon one, as even this flashback in the manga wasn't enough to know for sure. Thankfully in season 3 we got that same flashback in animated form, and in the background you could see the skeleton of the abnormal that killed Flagon's squad. This titan with red eyes never appeared in the manga version of No Regrets, so by its skeleton being in the official Attack on Titan anime, that proves it's the OVA that's part of the main timeline. Now, moving over to Before the Fall, this prequel was mainly set around 50 years before the main series, and in it there was a 10 meter abnormal who was the overarching villain of the story. The way I see it, this titan was the most intelligent, most muscular and most savage pure titan that ever existed, and it terrorized the scouts on separate occasions spanning well over a decade. It became so infamous that the Survey Corps gave it the nickname Ogre, which is appropriate considering ogres are usually just ugly giants that eat people, with a few exceptions. Starting at the very beginning of this prequel, many of the scouts had gone for an expedition outside the walls when Ogre suddenly appeared, but the thing that really stands out is that he ripped someone's head off and threw it back over Walmaria. The act of throwing human body parts over the walls is not something a normal titan would ever think about doing, but like I said, Ogre was just twisted in the head and often did things to cause extra pain for no reason. The head then landed in Shiganshina and splattered on the ground, and this was all witnessed by the soldier's pregnant wife. The woman who saw her husband's head get thrown over was called Eleanor, and she was so traumatized by the events that she went insane and ended up joining a titan worshipping cult, but I'll talk more about this when we get to the final abnormal in the video. For now, all you need to know is that the baby she was pregnant with would grow up to be Kuklo, who was the main character of Before the Fall and someone who fantasized about killing Ogre for most of the series. Around 15 years after the head throwing incident, the scouts went for another expedition when they were attacked by this abnormal again, and the way he sprinted towards them was honestly terrifying. It was during this battle that we truly got to see how sadistic Ogre was, as he was killing soldiers in the most creative ways and sometimes didn't even bother to eat them afterwards. On one occasion, he kicked a guy like a football and sent him flying into the atmosphere, and a couple other times he flanned soldiers for fun by stepping directly on top of them. 
He also killed people by mushing them together and squeezing with his bare hands, and his intelligence meant that he would often pick and choose who he wanted to kill, rather than simply following his titan instinct. This was demonstrated when he ran past Kuklo who he should have sensed first, and instead tried to eat someone who was hanging off the side of Wolmaria. As you'll notice, this scene happened at night, which is a time when 99% of titans stopped functioning, so the fact that he was full of energy and able to run and jump in the darkness is another example of his abnormal characteristics. The issue with this prequel is that it wasn't just Ogre who could move in the dark, but in fact it seemed like a lot, if not all titans in Before the Fall had this ability. There was never an explanation as to why this was the case, but on at least two separate occasions, titans were seen moving in complete darkness before the sun was out, making them abnormals by definition. Naturally, some of them were more interesting than others, like this titan who appeared in chapter 12 that was literally picking up other titans and throwing them at the main characters. The idea of a titan launching another titan is something that we saw Reiner do in season 2, but for a pure titan to do it, it shows a level of intelligence that you don't see every day. Other interesting abnormals include the bearded titan, whose standout feature is his amazing facial hair, and the stealthy titan, which quietly crawled on all fours to catch the scouts by surprise. This particular abnormal was super impressive because it managed to be so quiet that it avoided being detected by Kuklo, who by that point in the series was like a titan radar who could always sense when they were approaching. Finally, the last abnormal I wanted to mention was Mammon, whose death was arguably the most important of any pure titan in history. As you'll see in a second, without this titan the cervical would have been permanently disbanded many years ago, and if that happened then it's hard to imagine what people like Armin and Erwin would have done with their lives. Starting at the beginning, Mammon broke into Shigantina 70 years before the main series, when the front gate was opened by a titan worshipping cult. This cult is the same one that Eleanor joined after she went crazy, and after Mammon entered the gate, over 5,000 people were confirmed to have died. At this point in the timeline, ODM gear as we know it wasn't a thing, and more importantly, nobody knew how to kill a titan, so the garrison and the survey corps were pretty much useless when it came to stopping his rampage. In the manga, we got a good look at how Mammon casually walked through Shigantina eating whoever he wanted, and at one point he cornered a bunch of civilians and was picking them off one by one. Despite the crazy amount of victims, the royal government forbid people from talking about this incident after it was over, and erased all traces of it from the record, something which I think is believable given that we've seen MPs do similar things in the present day. Anyhow, the first person Mammon ate during his rampage was the pregnant Eleanor, but somehow her baby managed to survive and was born once the titan vomited them out, hence why Kuklo was often referred to as the titan's son. Other people eaten include Karina, who was the assistant to Anhel Altenin, aka the guy who would invent the ODM gear that we know today. It was due to his rage about Karina's death that Anhel single-handedly lured Mammon outside of Shiganshina in a failed attempt to kill the titan, and being an abnormal it completely ignored a crowd full of people while it was chasing after him. Months later, Anhel accompanied the survey corps for an expedition to capture a titan alive, but just as the sun was rising Mammon managed to find them again, with only 18 out of 60 soldiers surviving the encounter. As I said, no one at this time knew how to kill a titan or that titans even had a weakness, so the surviving members could only retreat back to Wolmaria as Mammon followed them close behind. It was at this moment that a soldier called Sorum put an explosive in his own mouth and then he purposefully allowed himself to get captured by the abnormal. As the titan squeezed him half to death, he slashed it in the eye which caused Mammon to let him go, and Sorum quickly stabbed into the nape so that he wouldn't fall to the ground. He had no clue that the nape was Mammon's weak spot, but he bit down on the explosive anyway, killing both human and titan in the process. This was the first time in history that a person from Paradise Island had killed a titan, and thanks to Sorum, the scouts realised that titans do actually have a weakness. Sadly though, because Mammon's body evaporated like all dead titans do, there was no evidence that the scouts defeated him, meaning the royal government publicly reported that the mission had failed. As a result of the failure to capture a titan, the conservative politicians gave the order to seal the gate in Shigatshina permanently so that it could never be opened again, and also the survey corps meant to be dissolved. Had this gone ahead then the timeline would have been seriously messed up as you can imagine, but thanks to the knowledge they gained from defeating Mammon, the scouts went on one last unauthorized expedition to kill another titan. The success of that following expedition is the only reason why the politicians decided not to close the gates for good, meaning without Sorum's sacrifice and the knowledge gained from it, the survey corps would have stopped being a thing around 70 years ago. Last word to say about Mammon is that he was 10 meters tall, and his name is a biblical reference to the demon of greed, which makes sense considering just how many people he ate in Shiganshina. Now, regarding the topic of whether this is canon, personally I think the prequel expanded on the lore of Attack on Titan very well, and there is some evidence connecting it to the main series. For a start, the Ice Burst Stone was first introduced in Before the Fall, and Isayama later made this a plot point in Attack on Titan, so you know, that shows on some level that he acknowledges the series, 
but in my head there are two things that potentially stop it from being fully canon. The first thing is the unnatural amount of titans that were able to function without sunlight, despite Isayama establishing that this shouldn't be possible. Hanji's experiments in season 1 showed that pure titans will eventually run out of energy without exposure to the sun, and the only exception to this rule were the abnormals created by Zeke and his royal blood. Those titans were able to use moonlight to function, but clearly in this prequel Zeke couldn't have made Ogre and the rest of them, as you know, this was decades before he was even born. The question then becomes, did someone else of royal blood make these abnormals? And you know, while I think it's unlikely, there is one theory I have that might explain it. We know that when Carl Fritz erected the walls on Paradise, he erased the people's memories, making them believe that the walls were there to protect them from the titans. Years later that statement would become true, as Marley kept on sending pure titans to the island, but in the very very beginning, there wouldn't have been any titans outside the walls at all. I say that because when the Eldians first moved to the island, Marley was having a civil war at the time, and I'm not sure sending titans to Paradise was a priority, so at least for a while, the island was completely safe. In this time of peace, it's theoretically possible that the founder himself made some pure titans, just to make his story more legit to the garrison soldiers who'd be standing on top of the walls. If those soldiers never saw titans, then they might start to doubt if the story Carl Fritz had put in their mind was true. So by creating a few abnormals and sending them to the outside, then the fact titans are real would never be disputed by anyone. If they were created by the founder himself, then that's the most plausible explanation you're going to get as to why they can move in complete darkness. But <laughs> let me know in the comments down below. I know this is a crackpot theory, but it's the, the best thing I could come up with to explain why this is the case. The second thing that makes me wonder if this is canon is the existence of George Picali, who was the former commander of the Survey Corps. George's very existence contradicts the main series, because in Bystander, which is one of my favourite chapters, Keith Shard has stated that he was the first Survey Corps commander to be alive to see their successor. Until him, all previous commanders had died before their successor was named, so the fact that George was alive to see his son Carlo lead the scouts is a direct contradiction. I guess in theory you could say that Keith is an unreliable narrator and maybe he doesn't know all the facts, but when it comes to this, it's really something he should know. For that reason, the existence of George implies that Before the Fall can never be 100% canon, although like I said, maybe Keith just didn't know what he was saying. Anyway guys, thank you for watching this video, and if you enjoyed it then be sure to drop a like and hit that sub button so you don't miss future content like this. Until the next one, peace out.